So what we've been looking at is we've been comparing some New Testament scriptures <clears throat> from Isaiah chapter 8. Y'all remember that? And um, we wanted to get a little more grounded uh, in that in our personal lives and not just have it a good teaching out of Isaiah. So I felt like the Holy Spirit kind of nudged me and said, let's go through some of the New Testament scriptures, and we've been doing that. <clears throat> but just as a reminder, because you may not remember, we were in Isaiah 8, and um, in verse 7, it says that the Lord is bringing up this strong, strong uh, power, which was, is Nebuchadnezzar, and um, <clears throat> let's say, wait a minute, this is Isaiah. So he's bringing up this strong power, and it's Assyria. And he tells them, and of course, he, this is the, just a repeat of, for, for Jeremiah that will be coming, because it was the same thing, and it, that was Nebuchadnezzar coming. And um, he says things like this, Associate yourselves, O ye people, and you shall be broken in pieces. Uh, uh, and give ear. All ye of far countries, gird yourselves, and ye shall be broken in pieces. Gird yourselves, and ye shall be broken in pieces. And remember, he, he repeated that, uh, that message. And then he says, Take counsel together, and it shall come to naught. Speak the word, and it shall not stand. For God is with us. And then he says, uh, For the Lord spoke thus to me with a strong hand, and instructed me that I should not walk in the way of this people, saying, Say ye not a confederacy, um, neither fear ye their fear, nor be afraid. Sanctify the Lord of hosts himself, and let him be your fear, and let him be your dread. So we jumped into First Peter because it's got many examples of this, including the sanctify the Lord, which is the only phrase in the Old Testament that uses it is here in Isaiah. And maybe you, maybe you would remember this, but early on, in, for those of you who were in the First Peter class, <clears throat> I made a statement. And that statement was that I believe that, that Peter was greatly influenced by the the Psalms, and y'all remember we went through a bunch of Psalms, and they were a bunch of references to Adonai, but they were also references to Peter's words. And I said the other one was Isaiah. And so here and in other places, we find that. Okay, so, um, so we're going to go this time, in, in light of the scriptures I just read in Isaiah 8, we're going to go this time now to 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 17 and 18. And um, here it is <clears throat> uh, a reference to evildoers are that which is, um, well, we got... <clears throat> You got the evildoer here, but you got the Lord in the corridor. Can you see him? He's kind of floppy today. <laughs> okay. There he is. He's here. Yeah, well, his head's sticky. All right. First Peter three seventeen and 18, for it is better if the will of God be so. And... You know, I don't know how far we got into it. I remember a chart. Let's see where we had the will of God. And we showed that all of that was related. The wording will of God was not just the general will of God. It's not. Not in First Peter. It is a reference to this spirit. <clears throat> all right. So here it is being used. Let's see if it's in reference to this spirit. For it is better if the will of God be so that you suffer for well-doing than for evil doing. For Christ also hath suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. And so you have, you have, um, if it is that time of the corridor, 
the will of God, then it's better that you suffer for well-doing than if you're doing things wrong. Um, for Christ also once suffered for sins. <clears throat> and, uh, and then it says the just for the unjust, meaning that he did nothing wrong, and yet all of this came down upon him. All of this, whether it was the Romans or the hierarchy of, of religion or the people <clears throat> that were supposed to be God's people, okay, and let me tell you, the corridor, that can be your, your place when you get in there, um, whether male or female, and you're in the hot spot there. <clears throat> the evildoer here could well be a bunch of Christians, yeah, or a bunch of God's people. Let's, you know, let's just kind of put it in that context. Um, God will still use it. He'll use that. All right. So um, the, he suffered the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. And so there's a couple of things that are mentioned here that if we ever go back to First Peter, we'll expand upon. But that is that um, suffering the just for the unjust was the method he was using to bring us to God. Now, most of Christianity is not going to understand that. I, and I understand it. I don't look down on them or whatever, because I, I didn't understand it for the longest. But there it is, that God uses this spirit, if we go into something in this spirit. Now, if this is just, if this is just random stuff and somebody's attacking you and, you know, and let's, let's even say that, that uh, you, you didn't do anything wrong. Let's say it works. Somebody accuses you of something. You didn't do anything wrong and they're just attacking you. And you just, you know, say, look, you, you're, you know, you're accusing me of something I didn't do. And, uh, you know, we start railing back and all the things that First Peter talk about or the, or the New Testament talks about or the prophets talk about. Um, then it's, not, it's no longer the just for the unjust. It's a, one evildoer against the other. And nobody will be brought to God under that situation, under that circumstance. See, God wants his son in us and what that means specifically instead of some general you know you know uh ethereal meaning what it means specifically is he wants the lamb of god he wants the the christ who suffered to be manifest in us toward them And a release, not of the Holy Spirit, but a release of that Spirit under the Father as a sweet savor, as, as an offering. The, the, whatever they did in the Old Testament were shadows. All those lambs killed and came, came up to God and was a sweet savor. That was shadows. This is the real deal now. We live in the real deal. Okay? And this exact situation with the corridor is a sweet savor offering. It's done willingly. All right. So, so there is this thing about the just for the unjust it being done in that spirit that he might bring us to God. And he did have that spirit. And we were brought to God over the fact that Jesus didn't deserve to die, and yet he died for us. Much bigger than that, but there's your basic gospel explanation of, of Jesus' death. Um, but then it says, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. Okay, so there is this, there is, yeah, there's a death, as it were, going, going in through here. Um, it's a death to your rights. It's a death to your 
um, uh, reputation, or if that's if that be part of the deal, um, it's a debt to so much, but it results in now we say well it, it, it's going to result in me getting to go to heaven when it's all over with god will look at my little life and the, the those times that i did that and he'll go oh you're worthy to get into heaven but no the the real resurrection is him in you in that horrible situation where he comes up out of you and that now you're being quickened by the spirit of the thing now, does it have eternal consequences? Or consequences, not the right word. Eternal results that means whatever, you go to heaven or whatever. Sure it does. Why do I, Randy, why do you downplay that? It's so important we get to go to heaven. Why are you downplaying that? I'm downplaying it because to God and his heart, to get Christ out of us in the image of that lamb is so much bigger than we're going to get to go to heaven and have a big party. It is. It, bigger to him. We may say saving my sorry skin and getting to go to heaven is the best thing ever, but not to God. And it shouldn't be to us. The greatest thing ever should be Christ. Christ is alive and he's seen in earthen vessels and it is seen that the excellency of the power is of God and not of us. That's what is it called? The, the greater glory, the higher glory, higher praise. Okay, so um, so in this verse you have don't I mean you don't have it directly in this verse, but it is surrounding it in the, in First Peter, all through there, not to assemble yourselves together and start figuring out a plan and starting to figure out how we can make that person look worse than me so that people will go, well, I'm on your side then because they look way worse than you. See, Jesus didn't try to do that. The, Pilate, Pontius Pilate said to him, don't you know Speak up. Don't you know I have power to kill you or to let you live? And Jesus said, all he said was, "I, you have no power except to be given of God. And that's, that's not an answer of justification. That's a just fact. That's a heavenly fact. <laughs> you, you know, you're you're in that situation. Jesus knows. I'm in the corridor, as it were. I'm in this situation of my father. And I'm with my father. God so loved. Everybody knows one scripture for sure. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And the word giving his son is turning him over to death so that he could do it in a certain spirit that could bring us to God. Or else, like I've, like I've said a few times over the years of my years, that, that if Jesus comes to this earth and then they start accusing him and he starts accusing them back, and starts using power, 10,000 angels, to get, to get his way um, and avoid any pain or whatever, then though he is God acting that way, he has turned the light out on God. He's literally turned the light out on God because that spirit is God. 
it is God. Now, it's God as a person, but God is the, his substance is, is that. All right. Let's go to, uh, I think I got a couple more of First Peter, and then we'll hit a few others. Let's go to First Peter um, 4. Uh, we'll look at verse 1 and 2, and then we'll drop down. <clears throat> First Peter 4, verse 1 and 2, For as much then as Christ hath suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves likewise with the same mind. Okay, arm yourselves likewise with the same mind. Okay, um, this is... This is the uh, desire of the prophets. Their desire was that this is the word of God. They may not have fully understood that, that that was his spirit or not. It didn't matter. This is the word of God. And he's trying to get them with that spirit, with that mind. Arm yourself. It, it's it's. It's a form of armor. It's not a get out armor. Get out of it armor. You know, it is, it is a bearing armor. Bearing the sufferings armor that allows you to stay in the fiery furnace, to go in and stay in there and to let Christ be seen in the midst of all that instead of you. Instead of letting him be the center, letting him be the power. And it's an arming, it is. It's a, it is, as it were, it is like an armor. Because when you are of that mind, you're, you are set. You know why you're doing it. You're not doing it, first of all, let me just make this clear again. Um, you don't do this um, because you're special. Uh, and you, you wouldn't do it on that basis anyway. Or if you did, you'd just be committing suicide, if you, if you will. You do it because you understand him his way, his nature, and you have you have given yourself over to that. Uh, what's a better way of saying it? You have bought into him as that's my God. See, see that lamb, slaughtered lamb? You see how slaughtered he looks? See him on the throne? That's my God. They're not looking for this victorious, you know, one sitting on the throne that says, I defeated everybody and da 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 da. And, and when they say gl all glory and honor, read it closely. They're glorifying him because of his death, because he died, because he, he, he gave himself in that spirit and in that way. So this isn't, this really isn't something to play around with or to, to have a uh, martyr spirit, which is not the spirit of the Lamb, uh, and go, okay, I'll do it. I'll give up what I, I'll give up what I love. <laughs> uh, well, God did give up what he loved. It was his only begotten son. For God so loved. And that's, that's the basis. It can't be our trying to fit into a teaching or a doctrine of new creation fellowship for God's sake. Can't be that. We want the real thing. We want to see it for ourselves. We want to be it. And we want to be it through God's Spirit revealing this one in us. Rooted and grounded, not, you know, 
I, oh, I'm with this one minute and the next minute, well, I don't know. You know, now you may go through that before you even, before you even get in here and you're out here, you may have, you know, uh, question marks that arise and whatever. But with time and with God sharing and opening the word and opening his heart of, so that the word is his heart. And, and this is for you see your calling, brethren, you know, so you go into that with him, in him, of him. All right. So I'm just trying to I'm trying to keep us from approaching this like the seven sons of Sceva. <laughs> well, you know, I know Jesus and I know Paul and I know Randy, but I don't know, you know, uh, you know, I don't know you. Um, no, we all want the Lord. And we all, um, we, will, we all must open our heart first to him and then, then see there's a seeing of him that gives you the freedom to give yourself. And what's funny is First Peter talks about that too. All right. So arm yourselves likewise with the same mind for, for, for he hath suffered in the flesh. He who hath suffered in the flesh hath ceased from sin. And I think I've dealt with that before. And again, if we ever get back to First Peter, we'll, we'll, we'll deal with it. But I can say simply that you know, if you just want to look at it in this light, it just answer everything. And that is the sin that it talks about that Jesus, which is which is going to come up down here, if I'm not mistaken, uh, is not that he, when he was a little boy, he didn't steal anything or, you know, when Jesus, um, when one of the Pharisees, uh, said something bad about Jesus before the trial, way before the trial, you know, his first year in ministry. Uh, he didn't, you know, well, think a bad thought about him for a moment. You know, it's not that that kind of sin. Or, or he didn't go out, smoke some cigarettes or, you know, any of the other things that we would call sins that we would attribute to just the usage of that phrase or words. It is the fact that he didn't rail back. He didn't uh, justify himself. He didn't. That's the thing. So you will cease from that sin. All right. So that he should um, that he should no longer uh, that he no longer should live the rest of his life in the flesh to the lust of men, but to the will of God, which is what we saw up here. For it is better if the will of God be so that you suffer for well-doing. See, the will of God, the, that phrase, it's about this stuff. It's not just generally that God wants you to move to Boston and, you know, throw tea in the ocean or something. Okay, so now this is the, we're going to go to verses 12 through 16. And this is in the same chapter. And if you'll, you'll see if you check it out, it's a flow. Okay, so let's look now at um, verses uh, 12 through 16. Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you as though some strange thing happened unto, unto you. Okay, so what is the trial? Well, um, the beauty of First Peter is, is that he tells you pretty early uh, that and, and he tells you throughout that it is testing if if you just still fully yourself dross and trying to be spiritual or if it's the gold standard which is Christ given to the fire so or or us since this is a testing of us we are given to the fire so that the gold which is Christ, which gold always represents deity in the Bible, so that the, the gold can rise to the top, can be what, what God's after. 
not just us. That's that's draws. But Christ in us. So, um, but re- but and don't think uh, some strange thing has happened unto you. But rejoice in as much as you are partakers of the sufferings of Christ. Some of you may have been thinking, I just wish the scriptures would just say it. <laughs> well, First Peter, even though it was so hard for, for some of us and we could never see past it, I'm telling you that this is what it's about over and over and over. All right. Inasmuch as you are, you are partakers of the sufferings of Christ, that when his glory shall be revealed, you may be glad also with exceeding joy. Okay, so this isn't first and foremost about you being glorified because you went through the corridor and I, I let people mistreat me and say horrible things, but I had the right spirit. Glory to me. You can't do that. You can't go you you can't go through that thing with you. <laughs> the fire will burn you up if there's no gold there. The, <laughs> it, the purpose of the fire is to get the gold and it won't burn the gold up, but it'll burn you and me up. Okay? Um so when his glory shall be revealed, you may be glad with exceeding joy. And that's what this little portion back here is of the corridor is you pass through the, the worry and the figuring and maybe some wrestling, but then going back and forth at the first, the first part portion. And then you enter into the heat of the thing. And then finally, you're coming out on the other side where there is, um, as it were, a resurrection. But more importantly, it is that Christ has been glorified in you as a bona fide lamb, that that lamb lives in you for the glory of the Father, because only Christ would go to that extreme. All right. So when his glory shall be revealed, you may be glad with exceeding joy. You will be glad with exceeding joy if you have the set spirit, because you'll give him all the glory. Okay. And you'll go, yeah, yeah, Jesus, you know. Glory to the last slaughtered lamb on the throne. You were enthroned on me. I mean, you know, it's one thing to stand with a multitude that can't be numbered and going, glory to the lamb, the slaughtered lamb of God. Glory and honor and power. Everybody's screaming. It's another thing to go through the corridor and at the end of it go, glory to the lamb of God that was slain in me, slaughtered. And it came out of me in this way. All glory to him. Mm -hmm. Hallelujah. All right. But rejoice in as much that when his glory shall be revealed, you may be glad also with exceeding joy if ye be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are you, for the spirit of glory and of God resteth upon you. Okay, so uh, if you're reproached because of Christ and and you're going through this thing because you've decided to join with him in the, his sufferings, then there's a, a, it says happy. I mean, it's one of the few times happy is ever used in the New Testament in that, in a, in that sense. And there is a happiness that it was him. It wasn't my selfish, self-protective mind that stopped the process. Happy are you. For the spirit of glory and of God resteth upon you. On their part, he's evil spoken of, but on your part, he is glorified. On their part, that he's, you know, the evildoers are, you know, uh, on on their part, he, you are evil spoken of. The evildoers spoke evil of you, and that's what put you in the corridor. But on your part, 
He is glorified. You know? Verse 15, But let none of you suffer as a murderer or as a thief or as an evildoer. I'm no murderer. I'm not a thief. Or evildoer. Or as a busybody in other men's matters. Yet if any man suffer as a Christian, and this is used one of the two times I think that Christian is used in the Bible. He, Peter, nailed what a Christian should be. So glory to God. Because most Christians have not nailed what a Christian should be. Let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on his behalf. You get in here and all the reproach is coming down and all the, the hell fire seems to be falling on you. Um, uh, and you're suffering as a Christian. Don't be ashamed, but let him glorify God on his behalf that God has allowed him. What's it say in, in Romans? Um, if you suffer with him, you shall reign with him. Uh, it, it says, God has not only blessed us that we could be saved, but that we could suffer for him. It's supposed to be a Christian. If that, you know, if, if your definition of Christian is correct, then you'll enjoy this. You won't be ashamed. You will glorify God on this behalf that he counted you worthy to suffer with him. And you get that in the book of Acts, okay? So they call in, who was it? Peter or the disciples, and they say, we're telling you not to do this anymore, no more preaching this and that, and, you know, and so, so, <laughs> It's funny because Gamalia, who is one of the top, well, probably the top religious leader of all Judaism, says, hold up there, fellas. Uh, you know, this guy, the, um, this guy might be of God. And these people, therefore, that we're dealing with might be of God. So we need to be careful that we don't fight against God. And they went, ooh, good point. Take them out and beat them real good and send them out. <laughs> it's like, uh, if I was the man, I'd say, were you listening to me? <laughs> but anyway, they go out rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer for him. That you don't see that much in the, you know, if that was us today and we dragged into court and the religious leaders were saying, well, this this person's a heretic and all this kind of stuff, which the person most likely for that to happen to would be right here. But if that happened, um, and you know, you're standing there and you're going, well, this ain't, that's not right, or you're twisting what I said, or you, if you really understood what this meant, or da 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 da, you can, you know, you say all of that stuff, and uh, and you're trying to talk your way out of it instead of saying, hey, this is the corridor, this is an opportunity, because that's exactly what happened to Jesus and Paul. So you would glorify God on this behalf. What a what a wonderful thing this is. And yet, it sounds like the very worst thing you'd ever have to go through. Well, I got to admit, it may be the worst thing you ever have to go through. But it will also be the highest praise, the highest glory to him that you would get out of the way for a change. Maybe for just once. I mean, he wants it all the time. And just be a, a burnt offering by Christ instead of a Christian, our version, our definition of Christian. Well, I go to church, I tithe. Okay, well, you know, I, 
my goal isn't to talk people into this. My goal is to read the scripture and just try to be led of the Holy Spirit and say what he wants to say. And at whatever cost of that, even. Because it's not my word. You know, the words I speak are not my own. They're not. They're his. All right. So, maybe we got time for one more, but this one, the next one is joined. Um, with, I really thought I had one more up here too. Uh, I think we might stop. You know, I could read this and you, you can, you can see, you, I think you can see the pattern. I think that it, it will be clear to you, uh, though it's a different set of, of scriptures. So let's go ahead and do that. <clears throat> let's close out with 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Six through 10. Now, this one has a lot of other elements that I'm not going to be able to de uh, develop tonight, but we can start next, uh, next week, Lord willing, if we have next week. And, um, and develop that. All right. Second Corinthians chapter 12. Let's just do 6 and 10. <clears throat> For though I would desire to glory, I shall not be a fool. He's talking about glory in himself. <laughs> See, boy, it, to really, I, I can't, I need to not keep talking because I'm going to just keep saying stuff here. For I will say the truth, but now I forbear, lest any man should think of me above that which he seemeth me to be, or that he heareth of me. And lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations that were given to me, a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me. So, so he was given, he was having a lot of revelations from God. Uh, it's called the New Testament. Here, here they are. All that um, uh, Romans has to say, and and uh, Gala then the revelations of the Lord in Galatians, and then how He's revealed in Ephesians, and then Colossians, and then Philippians, and you know, you just go on and on. All the revel different angles from Christ in you to we're dead with Christ to all of that abundance of glorious seeings of Jesus apparently that wasn't the, the revelations weren't the problem it was that that would puff you up and make you think you're something now now think of this think of this how in the world could we get puffed up over seeing Jesus and seeing that we're dead and it's not about us but him? Well, Paul wants you to know it can happen if we start claiming it, it we're the source in some manner. So, um, so there was given unto him a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, okay? lest I should be exalted above measure. And, you know, who's giving him a messenger of Satan? You say, well, Satan, well, no, God's doing this. God is doing this to, as it were, save his servant from pro-self, from being exalted above measure. You, you can be exalted, but exalted above measure. Uh, and no, we sh well. So, um, for this thing I sought the Lord thrice, meaning three times, that it might depart from me. 
And he said unto me, my grace is sufficient for thee. Okay. So three times he's asking God, and every time God's saying, my grace is sufficient, and we would say, well, it's not sufficient because your grace isn't getting me out of this. I mean, I'm looking for grace here because our version of grace is to get us out of stuff, you know. Uh, and God's version is, I'm going to leave this, in, this set this way until the thing that is destroying all the revelation is removed so that there will be a pure flow. Now, is God capable, capable of doing that? All right, there you have it. Yeah. Would he do it to you or me? There you have it. Yeah. Yeah. You know, he, he exalts the humble and he brings down the prideful. Okay. Um, my grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength. See, it's not just my grace is made sufficient for you. It is, it is the grace that my strength is made perfect in weakness. And he's talking about you being weak so that he can be the strength of this thing. And all glory goes to him. Okay. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then am I strong. All right. So we shall, we shall delve into that. And then we'll also use, <laughs> we'll also use a, a verse out of First Peter 2. Explain it. <laughs> Amen. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you. Thank you for the, the length that you will go and the lengths you will put us through to get your son out of us. No mixture, but wanting your son. Not us being the great one who has heard something from you, but just by your desire that your son would be known through earthen vessels that are broken and lowly. Thank you, Father. Teach, teach all of us that the risings that come in us are really warrings against the Lamb, making war with the Lamb. And that they are so opposite of what we think is important. Father, my prayer for me is do whatever you have to do to whatever lengths you have to go so that from this vessel it would just be the Spirit delivering your word and your heart and your Son in the manner of Christ crucified, the eternal slaughtered Lamb, so that he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen.